welcome back to our Christmas series we're calling The Big Give. And so I'm glad you're here today to celebrate that with us and uh, open up God's Word. In fact, I hope you've got a Bible or maybe a Bible app you can open up. Go to Luke chapter 2. We'll take a look at part of the Christmas story. This is kind of a continuation. Luke 1 is where we were at last week. We'll do the first part of Luke 2. Uh, next weekend, we'll, we'll look at the last part of Luke chapter uh, 2 as a part of this story. So we've been talking about the big give. That's why all the presents, some of you are wondering what's going on here, the big present. We started early on in December, <coughs> December talking about that uh, and talking about gifts. Jesus at Christmas, that is the big give for us. And so we're going to talk about why that is today. Luke chapter 2 is going to help us with that, but what is it that makes a good gift? But probably before we talk about what makes a good gift, let's talk about what makes a bad gift, right? I want you to think about the worst gift you ever received, okay? Some of you, that's going to be easy for you. Some of you are such nice people, you appreciated whatever you were given, and so you're going to have to kind of work through that. But what is the worst gift you have ever received? Uh, uh, often, I think it was Jimmy Fallon a few years ago that kind of started the hashtag worst give ever, and he would share uh, some of those. I thought I would look up some more recent ones to see what people are saying was the worst gift they ever received. Somebody uh, commented, uh, again, this is from Twitter, ha uh, hashtag best, uh, worst gift ever, commented, my stepmom gave me a dry skin brush that said it helps reduce the appearance of cellulitis. I, yeah, that's bad. That, that, that's bad. One wife said this, my husband gave me a toilet paper holder. I'll never let him live it down. <laughs> Guys, if you got that, get rid of it. Any of that practical stuff, get rid of it. It doesn't count. Not good. Uh, yeah, this is another person said, our in-laws gave our toddler a drum set. Worst gift ever. Yeah, can you imagine? I, th I think this one's my favorite. This is somebody talking about a gift that they received at work from their employer. Uh, they said, uh, I got a $5 Starbucks gift card for Christmas from my employer. And then they went on to say, the closest Starbucks is 110 miles away. <laughs> worst, worst gift ever. Would you just turn to the person next to you? If you've thought of a worst gift ever you received, would you just tell them right now, what's the worst gift you ever received? If, if they gave it to you, don't tell them that one, okay? It's purely hypothetical. Worst gift you've ever received. Now I want you to think about then what makes a good gift. What are the qualities that you would say make a really good gift, because we're going to talk about those, and we're going to do it in the context of the Christmas story, but what are the qualities, what are the things that would make a really, really good gift that you would really enjoy? Let, let, me, let me give you five of them that I've come up with, okay? Here's the first one, that time and thought went into the gift. Would you agree with that? Some time went into the gift. Somebody thought about it, right? They didn't pick it up off the shelf. They didn't go to my favorite gift store, Dollar Tree, and pick it up. They, they really thought about this thing, right? They really put some effort into coming up with what would be a good one. And the value is not necessarily even in the price that was paid. The value is in the time and the thought and the effort that went into the gift. And, and, and you look at it and you're like, that, that's it. It was heartfelt. So back a few years ago, my youngest daughter, Kimber, uh, she's grown now, but when she was probably 8, 9, 10, she didn't have any money, She, you know, but she wanted to give us gifts. She gave me a coupon book that she had made. And like you flip it open, you've gotten one of those before, or maybe you've given one before and, you know, turn to the next coupon, it says, I'll give you a 10-minute back rub, right? I'm like, all right, how can we duplicate that? I've got it on the copier, like trying to get more coupons out of that. Second one, you turn it over, I'll wash your truck. Like, I th that's what a great idea. But then you knew that, that really she had thought through the things that were important to me, the things that would help me. Time and thought went went into the gift. Made me kind of think, you know, now that I've got grown kids, I wonder if I could talk them into giving a coupon book to me now with some things that I would suggest, you know, like uh, I'll mow the lawn this summer, all summer. I'd, 
I'd, I'd redeem that coupon. Uh, I'll pay for next month's mortgage. That would be, you know, one that I would really appreciate. So anyway, if you're looking for a gift idea, you've got, you know, you're grown up and looking for something to give your parents. There's a coupon book idea right there. The gift has thought. Thought and time went into it. Here's the second one. The gift is personal. That's a good gift, isn't it? When there's a personal connection there with you. It fits you. It, ta- it, it, it speaks of you. There's something about that. Uh, the giver understood your likes and your dislikes, your personality. It fits. Something you've talked about, something you've mentioned, something you said that you like, those kinds of things. I, I have to write things down. I have a terrible memory. And so, like, if you tell me something, I, I might forget it five minutes later. I might remember it, you know, two weeks from now. But it, it comes and goes. And so, uh, when I, I have to write gift ideas down, I don't remember them. And so, my best gifts that I've given are ones when we've been walking through a store and Andrew's like, I really like that right there. And I'm over here writing it in my phone. She likes that. And then... You know, come December 24th when I'm trying to figure out what to get her, you know, I'm, oh, yeah, yeah, that. And she's like, how did you know I wanted one of those? What, how did, what made you think of that? Well, when we were walking around last July at the store, I remembered that. And so there's a freebie, guys. If you need help figuring out gift, write them down so you don't have to remember that stuff. The gift is personal. That, that helps to be able to do that. Here's the third thing. The gift reflects the relationship. There's something relational that's a part of it. It enhances the relationship, the connection part of it. Maybe there's a deeper meaning behind the gift. Like I've got this really special gift uh, my my kids gave me. My dad passed away last year, and for Christmas last year, they gave me a framed uh, uh, that has his handwriting. We're on a card he'd written, love you, dad. And that is a special gift to me. If you walked into my house, it wouldn't mean anything to you sitting behind the desk in my office. But for me, that has such deep meaning that that, that is something that they took the time to do, and it, it reflects the, the relationship there. There's a story behind it. and it's, Sometimes it's the story only the two of you know. There's a punchline that the two of you repeat back and forth, something like that. The gift reflects the relationship. Or, of course, this one, the gift requires a sacrifice. That makes an important gift right there. That's a significant gift. There was a price to be paid for the gift. Maybe, maybe it was financial, cost a lot of money, uh, and evidently that's kind of going on right now. I don't know. Every time you turn on the TV, it seems like somebody's given a $75,000 SUV to their husband or wife, you know, and putting a bow on it and, you know, an expensive gift, right? I mean, that's a, that's a sacrifice. How do people do that? It's, it's, it's not real, obviously, but uh, maybe it's not financial. Maybe the sacrifice was in time or maybe the sacrifice was in effort. It's a gift that came with a labor of love. Or here's the fifth one that I would say, that the name of the gift is fitting. Something about the name of it. Some gifts have just like the perfect name, don't they? How many of you guys grew up and you had G.I. Joe, right? Anybody? There's three of us. Okay, there's a few more. G.I. Joe, right? Every guy had it. You know, we played games with them. You know, you did did the, you know, Army stuff with them. G.I. Joe. I'm so glad they called it G.I. Joe because it would not be the same gift if it was called G.I. Ralph. It doesn't have the same ring, does it? Mom, I'm going to go take my G.I. Ralph and go outside and play. G.I. Joe is just fitting. Or can you imagine back those of you that, you know, had Rubik's Cube? uh, Man, that just seems like the right name as opposed to Bob's Contraption, Bill's Thingamajing, my, my, what? I mean, Rubik's Cube is the right name, or, you know, you can have hoverboard, or you can have floating skateboard. They're just not the same. There's something about a fitting name. My grandsons, I've got two four-year-old grandsons, and every time we're together, they want to get lightsabers out, turn them on, and we have sword fights with them, you know? I, I mean, they're, it's, it's, we're all over the place, and stabbing each other, and hitting each other with it, knocking off lamps, and everything. Can you imagine if instead of, of, of lightsabers, they were called glowing swords? Yeah, just that didn't, that didn't work. It's not, 
it's a name. There's something about the name. And so there's stuff about gifts, right? I was curious. I wanted to know what, what were like the most anticipated Christmas gifts, mainly stuff for kids, toys and electronics, that kind of stuff. I wanted to know in the past what, what those most anticipated ones for, for different years were. Of course, you can find all this on, on the Internet. You can Google it and find out. And so I was curious, just going back a few years, it gets funner as you go back. But just for fun, if you, if you wanted what I'm about to say, if you gave one of what I'm about to say, uh, then or you received one, certainly if you received one, I want you just to raise your hand. 20, 2014, I went back a few years just to kind of make this fun where you all think about it. 2014, Elsa doll was the big thing. Anybody give one, get one, want one? Okay, there we go. Uh, 2012, it was the Wii. Some of you still have the Wii. You get it out. You're going to get it out this Christmas. Do fun, okay? Uh, 2010 was an Apple iPad. I think just about everybody at least has one or something close to it. 2005, Xbox 360. Anybody? 2000, 2000 was the Razor Scooter. Anybody still have your little scooter in the garage, in the attic somewhere? Uh, how about this one? 1996, I want, you to, I want you to be honest with me. 1996. Tickle Me Elmo. Don't, don't lie. Okay? Or kind of like it, 1992, Barney, Barney Doll. Anybody? Okay, there we go. All right. Uh, 1989, Nintendo Game Boy. 1993, Cabbage Patch Dolls. Who still has them? Who still has a Cabbage Patch Doll? Look at there. Got a couple of those. Awesome. Uh... Uh, 19, let's go, let's go back a little further. 1978, Hungry, Hungry Hippos. Look there. Yep. Uh, 1975, this was my favorite, Pet Rock. I wish that would come back. Not Pet Rock in 1975. 1973, Electric Football. This was long before the video games. You put the guy, the football players on it. You plugged it in. You turned it on. And it just kind of shook them down the field. Anybody with me? Okay, I, I didn't get a new one for a gift. We bought one at a garage sale for me. And so I was missing some guys, but it worked. So uh, 1965, Rock'em Sock'em Robots. Anybody going back that far? Show your age proudly. Okay, a few Rock'em Sock'em. 1963, the Easy Bake Oven. Look at there. Just screw the light bulb in there, make a cake. All good, wasn't it? 1952, Mr. Potato Head. Now, that one's gone through the years, right? Man, I mean, we've had Mr. Potato Head for a long time. Kind of made a resurgence there with Toy Story. Here's the thing. There's a lot of fun gifts there. Some of those that you have had, some of them you wanted, some of them you asked Santa Claus for, some of them you begged your parents for. You know, some of them were just, you know, kind of... Uh, faddish and, you know, didn't last that long, but even the best gifts run their course. Over time, they get outdated, they become obsolete, and so uh, maybe you've got one of those stashed away somewhere, but more than likely it's in an attic or probably even higher likelihood that it's in some landfill somewhere. They don't last. They we're looking for the next big thing. We're getting the next anticipated gift. We want the next big thing. You have to go to the first Christmas in order to find a gift that meets all the criteria that we just talked about and yet never has and never will be obsolete. I want to go to Luke chapter 2, and I just want to read through and, and comment on on uh, this part of the Christmas story. It says, in those days, this is verse 1 of Luke 2, in those days Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. Verse 3 says, everyone went to their own town to register. 
Now, for you history buffs, you may be wondering who Caesar Augustus was. Well, it was actually Gaius Octavius. It was the uh, great nephew of Julius Caesar. So if you're looking for some context and you know your history, you know exactly when this time frame was. And so what he's going to do is he's, he's wanting to raise taxes. He's wanting to be able to, you know, uh, support all the military efforts and all the things that they have to do like governments do. And, and so here he is trying to figure out how we can collect more taxes. And for the Jewish people, one of the ways that they did that was the, they had this census that would make them go to their hometown, the place that their ancestors were from. And so that's exactly what's, what's going on here with uh, Joseph. He's going to go back to Bethlehem, ultimately, where his family is from. And I suspect Mary and Joseph, maybe like you and I, get exasperated with tax stuff and you know, we think about it, and then you got to do it, and you're, it, it's not the right time. And here you've got Mary and Joseph, they're about to have a baby, and you've got, it's, it's just inconvenient, it's demanding. And what's amazing about this is Caesar thought that he is being really, really clever. I'm going to raise taxes, and I'm going to find out where everybody's from, and we're going to get it all organized, and we're going to generate more revenue. Thinks he's being clever. But really, what's God, what, what is God doing? God is really using him to fulfill prophecy. He thinks he's in charge. Caesar, he thinks he's, he's got this going, but it's really God that is making all this happen behind the scenes. Luke chapter 2, verse 4 goes on and says, So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee. That's where they lived. He says that's in Judea. They went to Bethlehem. The town of David, that's, you know, his lineage, his ancestors, because he belonged to the house and line of David. So they would travel nearly 70 miles, a lot of it uphill, when it says they went up from Nazareth to, to Bethlehem. Bethlehem is this little suburb of, of, uh, of Jerusalem, and uh, they're making this journey, a long journey. Uh, this is probably not something where they actually rode a donkey. Maybe that happened for a little bit, but this was mostly walking. They're going to go to Bethlehem. They'll eventually return to Nazareth. That's going to be hometown later on, but for the time being, they're moving to Bethlehem, uh, going to Bethlehem, uh, because King David was from Bethlehem. And so Joseph's going back to where, where his ancestors grew up. Now, we talked last week about Nazareth being a small hole-in-the-wall place. We kind of joked about it, made fun. Like 300 people there. Bethlehem was even smaller. 150 people tops. This was a little, little, tiny place. In fact, in Micah, in the Old Testament, it says, but you, Bethlehem, though you are small, out of you will come the one who will be ruler over all the nations. So what happens when we read that right there, that is prophecy being fulfilled that God shared with Micah 750 years before Jesus even shows up on this earth. It's an amazing, amazing thing pre preparing us for that. Verse 5 says, he, Joseph, went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. So this is bad timing, but they have to go there. This is being required of everybody, and they're expecting this child. We know already this is not just any ordinary child. This is not even the child of Joseph. This is Mary, and this is a virgin birth, and this is one that had been uh, prescribed by angels both to Mary and to Joseph on separate occasions, telling them, you're going you're gonna to give birth to a son. You're to call him Jesus. An angel appears to, uh, to Mary. An angel re affirms that to Joseph. And then verse 6, this amazing thing happens that we celebrate now this time of year. This, this, this is what it all boils down to. While they were there, amidst all these oddly random timing circumstances, while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Can you imagine arriving in Bethlehem? And it, it, it's bustling more than it is, even though it's this tiny place and there's no place for them to stay. And the text here kind of 
reaffirms for us that it's probably more like a guest room that they were looking for. Bethlehem honestly was too small for there even to be an inn at. They're looking for just a guest room to be able to stay at, but there's no place for them to stay. So here they're going to have this baby in less than desirable circumstances. I'm talking about the Son of God. You, you would think there would be more planning and more pomp and circumstance to this. Like this would be a big deal, a big occasion. Here he is, though, born in a little bitty town. Nobody's even going to know. Ne- next week we'll talk about it. just the shepherds that showed up there in Bethlehem. There, there's no bed for this baby. They, they literally place him in a feeding trough. It's got a, we're talking about a teenage mom. We're talking about poor parents. I mean, when you look at it from that perspective, this doesn't sound like much of a gift. But I want you to go back to the criterion that we talked about earlier. What makes a good, what really makes a good gift? It's not that it's expensive. It's not that it's flashy. It's not that it's got the right bow and wrapping paper. What really makes a good gift? Let's see if Jesus qualifies for that good gift. Jesus, the big gift, the greatest gift from God. Remember, number one, time and thought went into the gift. We know that this gift was not a last-minute choice. This was not some random selection. This was not something that just fell together. Although from the circumstances, you might think that. It seems a little unprepared. It seems a little hurried. But the Bible tells us that before the foundation of the world was laid, that God had planned to give His Son, Jesus, to come to this world as the needed Savior. You need to understand this. Jesus doesn't show up in Luke chapter 2. That's not the arrival of Jesus. Now, that's the arrival of Jesus in human form, but that's not the beginning or the origins of Jesus. The Bible tells us that he was with God in the beginning, that he was God in the beginning, that he was a part of creation in the beginning, and that from uh, from Genesis chapter 3, some 60 major prophecies and like 250 plus minor prophecies have been fulfilled, things that were written about his coming to this world and his life. Hundreds of years, written hundreds of years before his time. And they're specific things. They're not things that could just happen. Things like he would be born of a virgin. You know, all the random stuff, yet it, it happens. And that he would be of the house of David, that kingly line, that he would be born in Bethlehem. That's part of the reason, even though it was told to them that he would be in Bethlehem, they, they missed it because no, no king's going to be born in Bethlehem, that little place. We're told that he would be presented with gifts. That happens with the Magi. And come to find out, while this may look differently, centuries of preparation, hundreds and hundreds of years have gone into this. Time and thought went into the gift. Well, remember the second one we talked about, the gift is personal? Was this gift a personal gift? Well, absolutely. Jesus came to enter into a relationship with us. He didn't come for us to have a religion, for you to be a part of a religion. He's not inviting you to be in some religion. He's inviting you to be in relationship with him. He's not just some God out there and you pick him and he's kind of out doing his thing. He, is, he, is, he, he, he wants to be in a personal relationship. Which is why the prophet Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus would come, 700 years before his birth, he spoke of the the coming of Emmanuel. And Emmanuel means God with us. That's the the, the gift we're talking about. It's a gift that is with us. Jesus is with us, Emmanuel. And, and not, not just enough for God to say that he would be with us. The Bible tells us that God became one of us. John 1.14 says the, the word became flesh. That's John's uh, verbiage for Jesus. The word of God, the expression of God is what it means. The word became flesh. He became a baby. He became a, a man, a person, and dwelt among us. Lived in our neighborhood is what one version says. 
So it's what we're talking. This is a very, very personal gift we're talking about. Now let's be really clear. When we're talking about personal, we're not we're not talking about it being an individual thing. Like I have my relationship with God, and you have your relationship with God, and, and we don't intermix or intertwine or whatever. That's not what it's talking about when it's we're talking personal. Uh, we're not talking individual because uh, our our relationship, our accepting of God's gift, it's very much a communal thing. We do it together. It's a thing that we help one another. So it's it, it's it's personal, but it's not just individual. Is it a personal personal uh, gift? Absolutely. Or here was the third thing: the gift reflects the relationship. Like it, 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 it does something uh, to help and engage. It reflects the relationship. John 3.16 kind of gives us some insight to that, doesn't it? It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That's, that's the big give, right? And I am so glad that the words in that verse are that he so loved I mean, it would have been very appropriate and very fitting for the verse to say, for God loved the world, right? We would expect that of God. God, a God's supposed to love, right? God loves people, loves you and me, for God loved us. But it's not what it says. It says that he so loved the world. It's, we're talking relationship here. So my youngest son, Kyler, when he was four, we put him on a baseball team. Why people do that, I don't know. That's just stupid, isn't it? Four-year-olds playing baseball and, you know, organize. This wasn't t-ball. This was coach pitch baseball. I think we had like three hits the entire season. I mean, it was just absolutely crazy. And we had, we, we, we were very fortunate to have a, a First National Bank in Coweta kind of adopted our team and provided the jerseys and all four. So FNB, First National Bank. Well, our coach didn't think that was very fitting, you know, First National Bank. Kids don't know what that. So, kids, what are you going to name our team? You got to use F and B. And as you can imagine, four-year-olds kind of coming up with stuff, and they decided that the name of their four-year-old baseball team was going to be F and B Fire and Balls. Fire and Balls. I mean, I mean, can you think about anything more exciting? You know, baseballs, fire, all that kind of stuff. So they put shirts out. And so we would show up as parents because we so loved our kids, right, with bright red shirts that said fire and balls right across the chest of them and my hat that said F and B just to remind people fire and balls. And so some of you are getting really nervous right now, aren't you? I can't believe we're talking about this. Fire and balls, that was the name of our team. So we would, we would be there, you know, every game, and we would cheer on cheer on our boy, you know, if there was a, if there was a hit, you know, the rare time, man, we're, applause, we're crazy, and, you know, if there was a catch, it, if somebody just paid attention, we applauded, right? I mean, I, they were so distracted, we just, we just loved it. I'm thinking about, God, the things that we do as parents, you get this, you've been there, because you so love your kids, yet, it doesn't even compare with how God so loved you that he would give up his son. Send him here for you, for me. That is a gift that reflects the relationship. That's what Jesus did for us. He desires so much to be in a relationship with us that he, Jesus came to be one of us. Love that. Or this is probably the simple one. Was it a gift that required a sacrifice? Oh, absolutely. Is it a gift that required a sacrifice? Yeah, and immediately our minds go to the cross, right? Think about the cross and what Jesus I mean, gave up his life. That, that endured the, the, the humiliation, the pain, the, the, all of that. We, we certainly understand that, but... It started long before the cross, didn't it? The sacrifice started long before the cross. An eternal God coming down from heaven to earth, from the infinite to the finite, from the unlimited to restricted and constrained, from heaven literally to a birth canal. That's what we're talking about. From glory to a feeding trough. 
we, we, we can't even fathom the sacrifice for this gift. 1 John 4, 9 and 10, God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. That's the entire reason why Jesus came. That's the purpose of the big give. That's the reason that we celebrate Christmas, that Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice. The fifth one we talked about is about the name. That the name of the gift is fitting. We joked about like G.I. Joe versus G.I. Ralph. Names are important, aren't they? Have you ever gone through to look just to, just out of curiosity to see what the most trending, most popular baby names are? Don't do it. It'll just make you mad, right? I'm like, really? Pe- people use those names? I know it's popular right now. We've got lots of people in our church that have had babies over the last couple of years, and they use like old-fashioned names. I'm like, that was my grandmother's name. We're naming little babies that, right? I mean, that's kind of a cool thing. I like seeing names come back. I keep hoping for Greg to come back. If anybody wants to name your son Greg, I, th- I think it would be awesome, right? I'm looking to see what's trending. Here's what they're saying, that travel-inspired names are trending. And here's why they think it is, that during COVID, people sat around, dreamed about going places, and so they just started naming their babies like travel-inspired names. And so here, here truly, I'm not lying to you, here are names that they are talking about uh, like Capri, Bay, Coast, Forest, Dune, Horizon, Ocean, Reef, Ridge. Popular trending baby names that people are using and again, kind of that inspired by, by travel. I, I don't know anybody that are named any of those names, and if you're naming your baby that, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to, like, offend you or anything. Uh, re- Real-life names people are using in our story. Mary and Joseph were told by God that they were to name their child a very specific name. You were to give them him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. That is a fitting name. That is a powerful name. That is a name that means Savior. Is it a fitting name? Absolutely. But there's probably one other quality and a gift that we find in Jesus that we need to talk about because each year these gifts that are popular at Christmas time, they just get replaced by a new line of gifts that seem to, you know, just be bigger and better and newer and all of that. And that's what makes Jesus the best gift ever. He's timeless. He's eternal. He is God's eternal gift. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is eternal. And what he offers us, what's a part of the package, what's a part of the gift, is eternal as well. It's eternal life. Jesus, the greatest gift ever. Ever. Father, we just want to pause and say thank you that we get to be a part of that, that we get to experience the beauty, the love, the joy of receiving the best gift ever. And so, Father, this Christmas, when all the distractions come about, when all the things that we think about, all the things that we have to do, the gifts that we have to buy, Father, would you, would you help us to focus and, and bring it all back to this gift, the original gift, the big gift. When we're giving gifts to other people, Father, would you, would you just give us a context of what true gift giving is like because you did it for us and you did it in the most amazing way. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.